Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the BetaShares Quarterly Economic Updates webinar, Climbing the Wall of Worry. My name is Sarah Hare and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we've got a great webinar in store for you. Before we start our webinar, uh, just a few housekeeping uh, items for those who may not be familiar. Um, a, rec a recording of the session and the slides will be sent out uh, to everyone who registered today. They'll be sent out this afternoon. Now throughout the session, um, if there's something that uh, you have a comment or you'd like to ask a question on, please do so. We'll be answering questions at the end of the, um, of the webinar. And on the right hand side, or uh, use the question widget um, in your screen on the side, looking like that. Uh, just also some additional housekeeping. Just please keep in mind that anything that we talk about today is general in nature. Uh, it is information purposes only. And before making any investment decision, please do your research, speak to your financial professional. Um, before you do make those decisions. Now we have um, a large number of people joining us today and I thank you very much for your time. Um, I just thought that I'd um, go over quickly about BetaShares. Um, now for those who don't know, we are um, one of Australia's leading exchange traded fund providers, that's all we do. Um, and we're very proudly Australian since 2009. Uh, we have 55 funds across all asset classes um, on the ASX and we've got 9 billion in funds under management. So um, if you haven't looked at our website, um, please please do so. Um, and there's information about, further information about us, information about our funds for you to consume. Now, uh, our host today, David Bassanese, I'm sure you're all familiar with David. And just before we do start, I would like to um, I would like to engage you in a couple of polls just to test the mood of the audience if I can. Um, do you think the RBA should cut interest rates further? So not will they, because um, I think everyone has an opinion on whether they will, but should they? Um, so if you can vote now, wow, okay, that's pretty good, no. yeah, mm. okay, great, and before I share that one, just got another quick one for you, it is, um, do you think the US and China trade war will be resolved? So. It's sort of saying that in the near term. Yeah. In the near term, me. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, great. Lovely thing. Uh, lots of people engaging with that. Now, before I start, let's just go back to um, the first RBA uh, race on whether you think they should. A resounding no. No one thinks they should cut <laughs> further. That's great, so a lot of savers in the house, potentially. And for the other poll, um, I don't know, I think there's probably no surprise there, but um, a few more yeses. Yeah. Um, eventually it will be resolved, I'm sure, but a bit more split down the line. So when that will be resolved, we're not sure. So I will just, without further ado, um, move on to the agenda today and I'll hand it over to David Bassney, BetaShares Chief Economist. Hi Dave. <coughs> thanks very much Sarah and thanks everybody for being with us uh, on what is a, a lovely spring day here in Sydney. Um, feeling very um, upbeat about, um, about things, uh, at least weather-wise. Um, not too bad about the economy either, I'll get into that um, uh, obviously in due course. So really this is the agenda, I'll talk a bit about the global economy uh, then uh, have a look at the Australian economy where we're at at the moment uh, and then some investment, uh, just an update and some investment thoughts uh, given the current climate. Um, so firstly starting with the global economy and really I'll start with this slide because again in my travels around the country talking to many investors and doing seminars and whatnot I get a lot of questions on, 
on obviously the US, but a lot of other issues as well. And really, this has been my my kind of answer to this. In terms, of if you're worried about you know big equity market sell-offs um, that you know can really um, disrupt wealth for for several years, um, these are sort of these are, these issues do attract headlines, but I, I still see them as as secondary issues. They're sort of interesting in terms of tactical tilts within markets. You know, whether you think Europe will do better than the US or or emerging markets or whatnot. But in, in terms of the overall economy. Uh, overall global economy and particularly overall direction in global equity markets, um, it's really the US that still drives things. So Brexit, for example, look at the you know 11th hour, it's looking likely that a deal could get done between the UK and the EU, um, judging by reports overnight, and then it's just a question of whether or not Parliament does ultimately approve that deal. Um, I guess we'll have to see the nature of that deal. Um, Obviously, ongoing squabbles in 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 Europe with with regard to Italy not meeting its um, objectives in in terms of keeping its budget under control. Uh, but no one really believes Italy is going to leave the EU, uh, which is ultimately what global markets are, co are concerned about. Um, so in that sense, it's it's really a bit of noise. Just on the UK, also, I mean, the UK is going through a bit of a downturn at the moment. But again, ultimately, it is only 2.5 percent of global GDP. Um, so it's not great news for the UK. It's it's not great news for Europe. Um, somewhat, um, you know, diminished uh, implication. But certainly globally, um, if the UK has a recession, I don't think it's going to drag the rest of us down. Iraq tensions. I mean, you've seen flare-ups with the oil price. Um, but again, oil seems to be pretty well supplied at the moment. But you know, you can't rule anything out on that front. Uh, and Hong Kong with the um, the ongoing, but again, markets seem to be pretty relaxed at this stage, you know, with the Hong Kong situation, and um, you know, we'll, we'll just see how that uh, how that plays out. But it, a lot of my focus today will be on the U.S. economy because, again, ultimately, I think this is what will determine whether or not the bull market we've been largely enjoying since 2009, um, with a few corrections uh, along the way, uh, will remain intact or not. Uh, and so, just on that. Uh, I just want to emphasize a couple of points. Again, I may have shown this chart in, in the past, but a lot of new pe uh, you know, new um, people have registered uh, uh, today as well. So I just thought I'd share with you this. This is a drawdown of the US share market. So basically, peak to trough declines in the S&P 500 price index uh, going back over 60 years, really since the mid-50s. The point is, as you can see, every, you know, say 10 years or so, you do get these big corrections of, or big bear markets of more than 20% declines. We get a lot of smaller corrections um, in between, uh, but most of the big bear markets, or the more than 20% declines, as you can see, are typically associated with US recessions. Uh, and those US recessions are marked in the, in the gray areas there. Historically, there's been three periods where you have had a more than a 20% pullback without a recession, uh, most famously during 1987. Uh, which is over 30%, but again, it, in those cases, it's been fairly short and markets have, have more or less recovered uh, within a year. Um, so again, outside of recessions uh, in the US, um, equity market pullbacks are usually, you know, um, not that not that bad. I mean, nothing's, you know, any pullback is, is uncomfortable, but not the big bad bear markets. And again, just to highlight that one more time, and this is the way I think about markets to share with you, so as you can see here, historically since 1955, there's been 21 periods in which the equity market in the US has fallen by more than 10%. Uh, and of that, the fall has been limited to less than 20%. percent it has been what's called a correction, you know, more than 10%, but less than 20%. Uh, and there's been nine occasions where a 10% correction has gone on to be a bear market, like more than a 20% decline. If you knew nothing else, that, that suggests that there's a 60% chance that a correction won't become a bear market. So there's still a 40% chance of a bear market, you know, pretty reasonable. But if you then make a judgment as to whether you think the US is going into a recession or not, you get these other probabilities. So of the 12 times, uh, there's been 12 occasions uh, in which the, um, the, the, the pullback hasn't been associated with a recession. And of that, only nine have been, nine of which have ended up only being corrections. And so only three, as I mentioned earlier, have gone on to be bear markets. So if you, if we're having a correction, again, we're not having one at the moment, but if the market was off 
And your indicator suggested, you know, your best judgment is a recession in the US still seems unlikely. There's a 75% chance based on history that the correction won't go on to become a bear market. Uh, by contrast, if you think there are, is a recession looming, um, then there's been nine occasions where corrections have happened during um, a recession and, and six of those, so 67% have gone on to be uh, bear markets. So I guess what I wanted to show there is corrections are often uh, and whether or not they turn into bear markets, you know, one of the key drivers there is your, your view on whether or not uh, the US is likely to experience a recession. Um, so, so obviously that begs the question, is the US facing a risk of recession? And again, I, I look at a number of indicators in this regard, probably one of the best I think because it's so timely is the weekly jobless claim. So this is an in, this is a number of people fronting up at state employment offices around the United States asking for, uh, in the US case, temporary employment, uh, unemployment benefits. And as you can see, during, prior to uh, all previous recessions, jobless claims have turned and have risen um, ahead of uh, a US recession. And in fact, historically, you need to see something like a 20% increase uh, in jobless claims from their previous low um, before you, you would say there's a pretty good chance we're having a recession. So that's a good lead indicator. And the thing about recessions also is we don't know officially when the US is in and out of a recession uh, uh, for typically till a year after the effect because the group that decide whether it is a recession, uh, the National Bureau of Economic Research basically look at a whole bunch of data uh, and then you know adjudicate but they don't usually make their decision until you know all the data's come in and it's usually with a with a significant lag. So what we what we economists try to do is look at data in real time and see how does that match up with periods historically that have been you know associated with the beginning of recession. So as you can see, jobless claims at the moment still low, incredibly low, back at 50-year lows, would you believe, uh, and and no signs yet of, a, of, of an upturn in jobless claims. So that's a very important lead indicator. The US labour market still holding up uh, pretty well. Another indicator that's got a lot of currency of late is the yield curve. So this is the difference between the US 10-year and two-year government bond yield. And as you can see, as many analysts have mentioned and the media have mentioned, prior to the last several recessions in the US, the yield curve has gone negative, so that's the blue line in that chart. Um, but what I would also point out is that's also historically been associated with a lot higher real Fed funds rate, so the US short-term interest rate, less inflation. So what's typically caused the yield curve to go negative is, is the Federal Reserve jacking up interest rates aggressively uh, to slow the economy, uh, typically because inflation seems to be picking up in the economy. So we're certainly not there. So although the yield curve is flat, it's actually on this measure not yet turned negative, and also real, the real Fed funds rate is a lot lower than we've seen prior to the last few recessions. So I think a lot of the flattening of that yield curve is, is structural in nature, reflects the, the reduction in inflation um, uh, really over, over the last few decades. So it's, it's flatter than it would normally be. Uh, and, and the real signal, the real, I guess, I think the more important signal is that red line, the real Fed funds rate. And at the moment, it's certainly far from being restrictive. Um, so again, that bodes well for the economy not tumbling into recession. The other point in terms of the US economy is wages. Uh, and again, so as, as you can see from this chart, prior to the last few recessions, uh, you've had the unemployment rate sink to pretty low levels. Uh, you've had wages picking up, so that's that red line, uh, typically picking up to around about 4%. Uh, and that's been a point where the Fed has been tightening aggressively. Um, as you can see now, the unemployment rate is low. I mean, that's probably why we are late cycle rather than early cycle in terms of the, uh, you know, um, the, the US economy. Uh, but wages at this stage at least aren't accelerating up toward that 4% pace. In fact, uh, so far this year, uh, they've actually started to, to ease off somewhat. In fact, I'm looking at the, the green line there, which is actually total uh, average hourly earnings um, across the economy. Um, there's two measures there. One is a, from a so-called production workers, and that's, that has a longer run history. Uh, but the one that the markets focus on now is the green line, which is total pri uh, workers, uh, and the history only goes back a decade or so. But, but well, I've put, I've, as a result, I've put both in. But if you look at that green line, it's actually eased off from about 3.2% annual rate uh, late last year to now a 2.9% rate. So would you believe that infl uh, wage inflation in the US uh, despite unemployment being at 3.5% at 50-year lows, uh, has 
has eased back this year rather than continue to accelerate. So that gives the Fed, you know, scope to, to possibly cut interest rates again if, if need be, and I'll talk about why it might, might do that uh, in a minute, but certainly it's far from needing to aggressively jack up rates in the way that we've seen prior to the last uh, few recessions. That's all the good news. Um, some of the, I guess, the, the biggest concern is, uh, if you can see from this slide, it's the global composite market, or the market global composite indicator. So it's a, it's a survey of uh, uh, companies globally uh, in manufacturing, and the composite measure uh, includes services as well. So as you can see, uh, business sentiment has been easing off since uh, the markets peaked uh, early last year um, in January. And it's really the trade, the, the tensions between the US and China in particular uh, have been weighing on business sentiment, so much so that, you know, we're really at, at the weakest point in, in the growth cycle globally, um, uh, than, uh, similar to where we were in 2015, 2016, when the markets also had a bit of a, um, uh, you know, a, a sort of rough patch, not, not a bear market, but a, certainly a rough patch, uh, and the global economy slowed down. So as you can see, if you look at that, tan line. Recessions are when that index does drop below 45. And so, you know, were that, that brown line in particular to drop a lot lower and hit 45, you could say, yes, the global economy is in recession. But at the moment, uh, I, it, this is like more, more, more so what's called a mid-cycle slowdown. So it's a slowdown within a broader expansion, um, but not a recession. And importantly, we don't want those indicators to weaken a lot further. We want them to start to stabilise. Um, now, one of the reasons they might start to stabilise is if you look at the next slide, you can see that a lot of the weakness up until recently, uh, again, has been driven by the manufacturing sector and it has been driven by uh, regions outside of the United States, so Japan, uh, Europe, uh, China. But what's happened really since mid middle of this year, probably the last two or three, you know, three, three to four months, is that indicators in the US have also weakened. So the manufacturing indicators in the US have weakened. Uh, and even if you look at the broader composite indicator, things have weakened. And in fact, there's another measure of manufacturing in the US called the ISM, ISM index, uh, which did uh, drop below 50 uh, in the latest reading. So that's why I've actually been arguing uh, in recent months that I think the, the bargaining position of Donald Trump with regard to the trade wars with China is weakening. Uh, because it's posing, you know, increasing risks to the U.S. economy, and that's why my, my view had been that they would uh, come to a deal. Might might not be the, the the deal that Donald Trump would have ideally liked, um, but it's, it, he'll probably accept something just to neutralise this issue going into a re-election year in 2020. Because really, if these tensions persist, if there's further flare-ups, um, the, there's probably a better than even chance that the US economy will go into recession because we'll see a, a real uh, downturn in business investment, uh, a downturn in a, uh, um, you know, business sentiment, uh, and we certainly will see that globally, and that, that in and of itself will drag the US down. So although Donald Trump's still talking tough, he's talking about raising tariffs and, and whatnot, really um, it's a very dangerous game he would start to play if he started to jack up tariffs even further from where they are now. Just to uh, some markets, so that's the backdrop. So that's why, look, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I know that's a bit of a, um, a cliche, but I mean, I'm, I, I think, you know, Donald Trump will see sense and see uh, that he, he wouldn't want to cause uh, undue risk to the US economy uh, next year. So even though the deal on the table at the moment and something that they agreed to uh, on Friday, so-called phase one, um, uh, he, he will accept and, and then, you know, agree to keep talking. But I, I don't think we'll see further flare-ups on, on the trade front. Um, but if we do, you know, all bets are off. But um, uh, that, that's my view at the moment. In terms of interest rates, uh, just a summary there of, of what's going on. Uh, as you can see, really the big feature of this year has been 10-year government or longer-term bond yields around the world, uh, including Australia, have been tumbling. So anyone owning fixed-rate bonds has been getting, you know, pretty nice uh, capital gains on bonds, because bond values go up when interest rates decline. And driven by not only the United States, but in Europe and Japan, uh, central banks have talked about easing policy further, um, and we've had bond yields decline. In the US, you can see the Fed funds futures, that, that, that the uh, black line in the top chart there. That's what the market expects the Fed to do with the Fed funds rate uh, over the following 12 months. So aggressive interest rate cuts had been priced into the market. 
um, with the Fed funds rate dropping to you know as low as one percent over the next twelve months. Now, if I'm right and the trade wars um, cease to be a negative for the markets, I think some of that expectation will gradually get taken out of the market. I think the Fed will cut rates at, uh, one once more and probably uh, later this month, just for, just for insurance. And again, also given that the fact that wages growth has decelerated uh, this year, but. I don't think the case is there for further aggressive uh, uh, cuts from the Fed thereafter, and in which case bond yields will back up somewhat, um, but again, not by a lot. So, you know, worst case scenario is US 10-year bond yields, which are currently around, you know, one and a half percent thereabouts, may may well bounce back up to say two percent over the next three to six months. Um, but again, unless the Fed is talking of tightening rates, um, I don't see them going a lot higher there thereafter. Um, and just the other thing that people watch for in terms of global, uh, you know, risk uh, credit spreads, and as you can see that bottom chart on the left, uh, credit spreads look have been grinding a little bit higher um, than where they were last year. It's certainly a high yield, high risk credit spreads, but they're still pretty low by historic standards. So we haven't really seen a big blowout um, uh, on, the, on that on that score either, which which bodes pretty well. US dollars remain pretty strong this year, which has been another feature. And again, that's just, I, get, I think, being the defensive part. Um, the market's being somewhat defensive. The US dollar is seen as a bit of a safe haven, uh, and, um, and uh, investors have gravitated to that. Also, given that up until recently, at least, uh, the US economy has been holding up relatively well uh, compared to uh, other regions around the world like Europe and, uh, and Japan. In terms of the equity markets, um, so this is, again, a snapshot of the global equity situation, the fundamentals. Uh, as you can see, look, the markets peaked really back in 2018. Uh, then they were very nervous for much of 2018. Then we had that, uh, that big sell-off late last year. We've had a strong then V-shaped bounce back uh, in the first quarter, and the markets have been holding up at those uh, high levels, you know, flirting with, with new record highs, but not really going on with it at the moment, um, just given the, uh, a, a, the trade uncertainty um, but what you can see also, the, one of the challenges for the market at the moment is if you look at the next, um, the, the second chart there on the right, is that earnings expectations have been revised down uh, over the past year. And as a result, so-called forward earnings, which is a, an earnings measure uh, underpinning the market, uh, has been going sideways. So the market was enjoying nice growth in earnings between 2016 and 2018. Uh, and over the past year, they flattened off. Uh, so that's until that turns around, you really don't see the market. It, it's 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 going to be a challenge for the market to um, rally, you know, in a big way from here with earnings flat. You can get some upside from the PE ratio. You see at the bottom chart there, the PE ratio globally is about 15 times earnings. Not that bad, but close to its long run average. But given where interest rates are, it arguably could be a little bit higher than that. Um, but so the market could grind a little bit higher on optimism with regard to trade, driven by the PE ratio, but ultimately what's going to drive this market uh, in 2020, um, it will be, uh, you know, hopefully a, a stabilisation in those earnings expectations uh, and then uh, forward earnings starting to rise again. Um, and if you look back, so the last period where we had that flat earnings period was in 2015-16. Um, again, when that uh, composite indicator I showed you earlier was as soft as it is now. Uh, but then, then things, uh, you know, righted themselves and earnings uh, started to, to accelerate again. So that'd be my base case. Uh, again, all, all contingent on Donald Trump not wanting to uh, continue on with the, with the trade wars in 2020. Just uh, some, a couple of, a few charts here just to go, really this is a snapshot of some major global trends going on within the global equity market. So the first one is a, is a snapshot of some key regions, so US, Europe and Japan, uh, emerging markets in Australia, and as you can, and what these are, these are relative performances relative to the global MSCI index, so the global benchmark index. So when these lines in these charts are rising, it means these markets are outperforming uh, the global market. And as you can see, really the standout outperformer in recent years, and even through 2019 so far, has remained the US uh, market and particularly the sort of tech exposed NASDAQ, um, the NASDAQ index, the NASDAQ 100. So that's continued to, to outperform uh, in this uh, sea of uncertainty. Um, emerging markets, 
Europe and Japan, not so, not so much. Again, because they've been particularly hurt so far, at least by the by the trade wars. Interestingly enough, the U.S. the Australian market has shown some outperformance um, on a on what's called a hedged currency hedged basis. So just our market versus the U.S. market. But if you allow for the fact that, or, or the global market, but if you allow for the fact that the Aussie dollar has been weakening this year, which actually boosts your return. Uh, when you invest in international markets because the, the, the Australian dollar value of your foreign currency exposure goes up, a market's been pretty flat relative in terms of relative performance. So all the outperformance we've sort of had um, uh, has been unwound because of the weakness of the currency. So if you're investing in offshore markets on a heads basis, um, you, you, you know, the, you, you've sort of, you, you, you haven't underperformed vis-a-vis -vis the Australian market in that sense. So bottom line, at this stage, the US market's been still continuing to do pretty well. Our market's holding okay, um, but emerging markets in Europe and Japan have been struggling. If you look at it from a sector point of view, and again, the standout there is the tech area. So this is global technology continuing to outperform. Uh, financials, uh, as in banks, uh, uh, underperforming. And again, typically what you see globally is when bond yields are, uh, are falling, uh, margins uh, for, for financials are being squeezed uh, and they tend to underperform. So falling bond yields over the past year hasn't helped the financial sector. Um, the materials there and the uh, energy sector also has been underperforming given the uh, softness of commodity prices. Um, uh, not so much iron ore, but certainly other areas like oil, uh, for example. And the other ones that's been doing well from a sector point of view are the more defensive a yield plays, as you can see in that bottom chart. So like global property, uh, healthcare, it's not so much a yield story, but it's a sort of defensive quality uh, and utility. So things offering you a reasonable yield and a reasonably reliable yield have also been in favour, as you would expect, given that bond yields globally uh, have been falling over this period. Just finally on the, on the global snapshot, again, this is something I will I will update on a quarterly basis. I think this is a very good sort of summary measure of what's what's really moving uh, in markets at the moment. And this is a, a, a looking at global markets from a factor perspective. But again, uh, factors are, are things like different characteristics of companies in terms of their earnings uh, stability, their high dividend yield, um, these sort of uh, qualities. And as you can see, um, again, the standout uh, over the of late and have continued to do well this year have been quality. So companies with high return on equity typically have been doing quite well. Um, uh, and generally, uh, and at, at the same time, a low volatility stock. So companies, again, that's consistent with that defensive yield uh, type of sector that I was explaining before. So uh, quality, which is often many of those companies is technology uh, and, and low volatility uh, have been out, outperforming and cyclical, uh, and, and so-called so growth stocks also doing quite well, which because they're all part of that quality. Um, so again, one, a big topic of de debate globally has been the fact that growth stocks have continued to outperform value stocks, and everybody's waiting for a for a a um, a, a, um, a rotation into value. Um, but again, one of the biggest sectors that are into value is the financial sector. So until you see the financial sector turn around, um, that would be a challenge. And also one of the biggest sectors in the uh, in the, uh, the growth area is technology. So it's really almost boils down to a, a financials versus technology story, that growth versus value. I, I, I still think, you know, in this environment, the sort of growth areas are still going to continue to do well. Um, and you will see a rotation of value more likely, um, you know, when things do weaken and, um, uh, and, you know, people are a lot more defensive in, in, in nature. In terms of the Australian economy, um, how are we going for time? Yes, yeah, very good. Um, so start off with consumer spending because really this has been the big story uh, since the middle of last year. This is what's changed everything in the economy. We had a, a period where consumer spending was growing along uh, pretty nicely. Well, okay, to around about two and three quarter percent, three percent. Uh, and really since last year it slowed off uh, to around about two percent. So it's gone from near three uh, down to two and a bit less. Uh, and if you look at retail sales, it's, it's chugging along at a pretty weak uh, pace. Uh, we've had consumer sentiment uh, also come off somewhat. Uh, and that's been the change. So consumer spending is 60% of GDP. So when, when the consumers decide to uh, tighten the purse strings, um, uh, that, um, 
you know, has a, has a major impact on, on GDP. And one of the reasons they've tightened the purse strings is, is, the, is, is evident in the following chart, uh, where it's got real consumer spending in the brown line and the dashed line is real household disposable income growth. And as you can see, in recent years, income uh, spending has actually been running ahead of income growth. Uh, and how that's been happening is that households have been running down the household savings ratio. So in the national accounts, there's uh, something called the savings ratio, and it's basically the difference between uh, what is estimated that consumers are spending and, and what, they, what they're earning. Uh, but there came a point last year where you know, the savings ratio got pretty low, and I guess households decided they couldn't continue to keep running down their savings rate uh, and, and consumer spending has slowed down to be more in line with the weakness of income growth. And why has income growth been weak? Wages growth has been weak. Uh, employment growth has been okay, but uh, a good chunk of that has been in part-time employment. So overall uh, wages are uh, not, not as good as, you, as, you, uh, as otherwise. And, 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 and another fact and something the RBA has pointed to in the past is that, would you believe that uh, income tax collections have been pretty strong? So the ATO is becoming smarter in, in um, clamping down on tax deductions, uh, clawing back taxes, and so in, uh, income tax growth has been running at like 8 to 10% annual rate over the last few years. And it's actually been you know, a, a major, well, I wouldn't say major, but a, a notable contributor to the slowing in income growth, which is ironic because you know, the government wants us to be out there spending and, and uh, you know, they're doing a pretty good job of clawing back, um, in, you know, a lot of our income growth. The, uh, the other element, of course, has been the up until recently at least, the decline in Sydney and uh, Melbourne house prices, the so-called negative wealth effect. So the Sydney uh, market, in, uh, for example, was down something like 13% uh, from its highs uh, in mid-2017. And slowly but surely, that ongoing negativity of house prices decline ha has seen um, you know, households start to um, you know, tighten the purse strings somewhat. Now, in terms of some major indicators, things haven't really changed around all that, all that much for the better uh, in recent months. So a couple of uh, indicators there. The NAB Business Survey of Business Conditions, as you can see, um, it's continued to basically gradually weaken uh, this year. Uh, and also home building approvals, uh, so um, which were at a very high level for several years, uh, the trend decline has continued. So we're facing a situation where the, the home building boom um, is going to start to dry up as we head into to 2020. So a lot of those high-rise apartments will be uh, blocks that you, I'm sure you've all seen as you drive around, um, cities of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane especially, um, will be completed and there's not a lot of new, uh, new development in the pipeline. Bottom line of all that is the unemployment rate is starting to trend higher. Um, you can see the, the employment indicators have softened to so the NAB Employment Index. Um, if you, you read it correctly, it's an inverted index. So when that orange line is rising, it means employment intentions are weakening. And similarly, ANZ job ads continuing to gradually uh, weaken as well. So um, again, I've been calling the unemployment rate to gradually trend higher. It's hit 5.3% from a low of 4.9% earlier this year. Um, and I think it's still on the way to say at least say 5.6, 5.7 uh, over the next uh, six months or so. So um, that, that, that's really the backdrop in that. Uh, now, the, the, I guess, so really the RBA's cut rates um, several times already, but in most indicators, there hasn't been a lot of evidence of, of any real positive impact and also, no, don't forget that the government is also giving an extra thousand dollars as a tax uh, refund to, to, to many uh, average income earners uh, as part of the tax cut package. But again, the, the evidence is that not a lot of that has, has shown up in the uh, retail activity or, or a boost in business or consumer confidence. Now, one area where it has shown up is in the next chart. Um, we've seen a decent rebound in auction clearance rates. Um, again, this is a national measure, but Sydney and Melbourne are a big part of that. Um, and if you look at it, the house prices, uh, which had been trending down, basically bottomed a couple of months ago and have now um, moved a little bit higher. So just as an example, in Sydney, the, the core logic measure of median house prices, which did decline by 13% between mid-2017 and earlier this year, has bounced up about 3% uh, in the last few months. Um, 
Now, you know, there's some debate that, you know, maybe low rates now are going to cause a re re resumption of the Sydney property bubble. Um, it's possible, it's possible, but I mean, the, the Sydney market is still quite expensive. It, notwithstanding the fact that prices did decline for a couple of years there. Um, so I, 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 I doubt you were going to see a big bounce in house prices, um, but, 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 but a bit of a, an upward correction, um, you know, further upward correction seems likely. But barring a big rebound, again, I don't think it's going to be enough to sort of change what is a, a, a more negative outlook at this stage for consumer spending um, and as a result for the economy. Bottom line is, look, the RBA's probably still got more work to, to do. Um, for those that read the AFR, you may have seen a column from me uh, earlier this week where I actually argued I don't think the RBA should cut interest rates anymore. So I was very interested to see that many people uh, today did agree with me on that. And basically the problem is I think it's having a reverse, uh, or, or what, what economists call uh, a perverse uh, or a negative expectations effect. So if anything, the RBA cutting rates has worried people more than given them cause for celebration, um, given that the rates are so low. And again, cautious consumers, people with a mortgage, seem more intent on saving that, you know, any benefit they get from their mortgage rate uh, than, than rushing out and spending that money. Um, and meanwhile, everyone else that relies on interest income is getting less income. So the combination of all those things isn't having a great impact on the economy so far. Having said that, the markets are still, you know, in fact, the markets are flirting with the RBA cutting rates twice more. Uh, if you look at that chart over the next 12 months, a cash rate of 0.25%. Um, I, I think there's, there's, again, my base case is I'll do one more. They'll go to 0.5. They've just recently cut rates to 0.75. And if they feel they need to do more, uh, quantitative easing is certainly still on the agenda whereby they go out and start buying up government and corporate bonds and trying to lower uh, longer term interest rates. Only problem with that is it, uh, you know, it doesn't have a, a lot of lending in Australia is based on short term interest rates, not, not so much long term rates. So it won't have as big a, a positive impact as that sort of policy has had in the United States. Uh, but nonetheless, the RBA will, I guess, feel the need to be at least be seen to be doing something in an environment where the unemployment rate looks like it is heading higher and not heading lower. So really that's the outlook for the RBA. Uh, unlikely at this stage they'll cut rates in November. I don't think that, the, I think the trade deal uh, that was announced last week would give them some, some cause to, to pause. Um, but by December, February, um, you know, pretty good chance they'll cut rates uh, to 0.5%. Aussie dollar likely to ease a bit further. Uh, I, just on the on the view that the, the you, yeah, we, we'll probably still more likely to ease policy somewhat more relative to say the United States. Uh, iron ore prices had a big rise; they're probably peeling back somewhat now. Uh, and the combination of those two things probably see the Aussie edge towards say 65 cents um, from around 67, 68 cents over the next uh, three to six months. So, uh, and in fact, you know, it, it may hold. In the best case scenario, the Aussie holds sort of where it is. Um, but uh, I don't see scope for a sort of big rebound in the Aussie. You know, the worst case, you know, it weakened somewhat uh, or, or, or hold where it is, but I can't see the case for it rebounding uh, in, a, in a major way. Just to conclude with the final section, um, key investment themes. So as I said, the bear market in the US recession is unlikely uh, provided the trade war ends. And again, to me, that's the big proviso. If, if Donald Trump spits the dummy, uh, and decides to jack up tariffs again uh, over the next few months, then you know batten down the hatches because we probably will have a global um, you know downturn next year. Um, but again, unless he's crazy, I don't think he's going to do that because he probably knows that that's would, what would be the result. Um, I think as you just remember that that U.S. unemployment situation, the unemployment rate is very low. Um, the cycle could continue for some um, time, but we are probably later cycle. So. You know, the best of the bull market is probably behind us. That does favour areas like quality stocks. And I showed you a chart earlier where quality is a factor. And again, we have an ETF that tracks global quality stocks, um, has been holding up pretty well, and they do tend to hold up well uh, even in, when, in equity market, well, relatively well, uh, even in periods where equity markets are pulling back. Modest rebound in bond yields are likely. Um, less so in Australia because, again, the RBA may well go forward with the quantitative easing. But if, if the Fed doesn't cut rates as much as the market is currently anticipating, you, you should get some 
uh, further rebound in, in bond yields in the US, but nothing to sort of lose any sleep over, I don't think. In terms of the positioning, as I said, late, where are we in the cycle? I think we're at this neutral late cycle stage, so you know, don't batten down the hatches too much and get too defensive because this cycle could continue, uh, but certainly keep a very close watch on the trade, the trade situation and, and those recession indicators uh, that I mentioned earlier. In terms of Australia, just an update on some of our income offerings. And again, given the very low interest rates in Australia, uh, the theme here is you, know, you need to be creative in seeking income. I can actually update this chart. The bank deposit, um, the, the, the bank deposit rate uh, as of you know, just the last few days has now declined to 0.75%. So that is the, the, the term deposit, the, the three month term, oh, sorry, the one month term deposit, the average one month term deposit amongst major banks is now only 0.75%. We have a cash ETF, AAA, um, which uh, usually gives you something like half a percent above the RBA cash rate. Um, so if the cash rate's 0.75, you could expect to get, you know, on, on, a, on an annualised basis, something like 1.25% on that uh, at the moment. But again, it's obviously if the RBA cut, 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 cuts the cash rate further than the, the monthly interest you will get on that on an annualised basis would, would therefore decline. Similarly with floating rate bonds, we have a, an ETF that tracks a short, a short duration bonds or floating rate bonds. They float in line with interest rates. Um, if you want more information, there's plenty on our website. But again, Relatively good capital stability. It doesn't move around too much in terms of capital returns, and it gives you a nice yield pickup um, over, you know, certainly bank deposits and a, and a more of a cash exposure. Then our bond uh, funds, fixed rate bonds, uh, and hybrids. And I, again, I won't go into the details, but um, the, the longer duration bond, obviously long duration bonds, the yields have all come down with the bond rally, but certainly relative to to cash. Uh, and shorter duration type uh, investments, they're still offering you a decent yield pickup. So in the case of our corporate bond ETF, allowing for the current yield, uh, the, the yield to maturity plus a bit of a roll yield. Uh, and again, this is an extra income we get just by the way in which we manage bonds over the year. You're looking at a prospective one year income return based on current yields uh, of just under 3% uh, on cred. And also then there's hybrids, um, allowing for franking credits, giving you after management fees, giving you a, a yield at the moment or a prospective one year income return, I should say, based on current interest rates uh, of just over 4%. So, you know, something there to, to consider if you're, you're seeking um, some, some uh, you know, a, a relatively stable uh, source of income that can be easily accessed on the market through, through, a, through uh, ETFs. Good range of, uh, uh, then if you want to go into the equity market, seeking different income opportunities, I've just got a few there. Again, this is a, a slide many will be familiar with, so it's really just an update on the yield situation as of end of, end of September. So our, our listed property, in fact, our Rink uh, Leg Mason Real Property Fund has been doing incredibly well uh, over the past year. The, the yield on that is 5.5%, uh, but because it's been this defensive uh, part of the market, uh, property infrastructure utilities, and because of the the, the, the guys who run this, the, well, the people that run this, the Leg Mason Group, have actually been outperforming the infrastructure index in the Australian markets. The overall return uh, on that has actually been better than than than, than the, the utilities uh, and, and infrastructure index in the market. Um, but that's the income you're getting from that fund. Uh, in fact, it was rated, I think, the best performing Australian equity fund uh, over the past year by mm -hmm. yeah. Zenith. Yeah. Yes, um, got a high yield fund as well. Give, again, a, a, an actively managed fund that invests in high yield uh, stocks. A, stocks with a high yield, but also expected to continue to maintain that yield and grow income, uh, at least in line with inflation. Then our covered call ETF and our harvester type strategies. Again, I don't have time to go through all of the details there, but they are different ways of getting income, extracting income uh, from the equity market. And if you want more information, certainly go and visit the, the relevant pages uh, on, our, on our website. Just globally, a few things to point out that gold has also been doing very well. And again, with the equity sell-off uh, late last year, uh, gold uh, uh, did jump high. And in fact, it's actually remained fairly strong this year as well. Um, so there's two ways to get gold exposed. You can buy gold uh, spot gold, well basically exposure to the US dollar uh, 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 spot bullion price. So we have an ETF 
uh, that, tr that basically invest in gold bullion bars, invest in a London bank vault. So if the value of gold bullion goes up, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, ETF goes up in price as well. In fact, QAU is the ETF and it was up 23% over the past year. Uh, but another way to get exposure is by investing in global gold mining companies. And again, we have an ETF MNRF. And as you can see, that's also done pretty well. And in fact, it's outperformed that, that dashed line there is relative performance uh, against the global market uh, index. And that, that, would, that um, ETF is up 54% uh, over the past year. So again, it gives you magnified exposure to prices in the gold. When gold's going up, typically companies will go up by you know, a, a, a sort of magnified degree. Similarly on the downside as well, um, but just, just so you know, there's two ways to play the gold market. Um, finally, uh, not, not finally, but just a few other things. Just to highlight, we do have what's called risk managed ETFs as well. Um, a harvester is part of that, Austin World, and what these are, they give you exposure to the market. So in this case, is the you know, top 200 Australian companies or the global uh, benchmark index. But we have a risk management overlay such that when volatility of the market picks up, there are various um, quantitative uh, rules in place that reduce exposure to the market. And these are designed basically to, to allow you to participate in m most of the upside when equity markets are rising. But should we have a you know a, a, you know like a big bad sustained bear market, they will try to limit the, the their aim would be to limit the downside. And certainly historically, these funds have done well. Um, during the GFC, for example, the group who run these funds will provide the rules, Milliman, have done well during big sustained uh, equity market sell-offs. Um, so that's something to, to, if you want equity market exposure, but you want some downside protection, um, should there be a big sell-off, um, something to think about. And the other one is quality, and I mentioned this before, this has been a standout performer, and again, it, I think uh, this is probably going to hold up, certainly if equity markets continue to rally, and again, if equity markets go sideways or peel back somewhat, this is the type of fund which historically has tended to at least hold up uh, in terms of relative performance. And um, so again, QLTY is the, is the ETF there, um, and really it's a, basically it's a rules-based strategy that it, that it aims to invest in the top companies around the world um, that have high return on equity, uh, reasonably good earning stability, uh, not too much debt. Uh, if they tick all those boxes, uh, they go into that, that you know, the top uh, 100 uh, or so stocks uh, are part of that index. And I've just got Warren Buffett there. He doesn't obviously he doesn't advocate QLTY per se, but he one of his key criteria when he looks at companies is return on equity, uh, a company's ability to generate good profits versus their you know the, the equity invested in the business. Uh, and that's one of the key criteria we use uh, with that fund. I will conclude with just a few contrarian trade ideas for 2020. Uh, <clears throat> these are things that, look, haven't been doing especially well of late, but if things go well in 2020, they could see a, a decent turnaround. So India, for example, we've launched an Indian ETF. The economy there has been booming and had a bit of a slowdown um, uh, through the early part of this year. The government and the uh, central bank have since um, uh, engaged in policy stimulus. The economy looks to be uh, stabilising and rebounding. Um, so I think that could be one that could uh, could rebound heading into 2020. And just as a bigger picture also, uh, again, those that joined us in the India uh, webinar uh, a few months ago, you know, the, the growth story for India remains very strong. And even as a longer term investment, that one um, I, I think looks pretty good. Uh, other one, obviously FTSE, we have a, an index that tracks the FTSE 100 index. Um, it's actually held up not too bad, but it probably could have done even better were it not for the huge uncertainty surrounding Brexit. Um, so if a Brexit deal is done, if the uncertainty of Brexit is resolved um, uh, pretty soon, I think the UK economy could start looking better uh, next year. Also, that's an unhedged ETF. And so if the pound does rebound in a big way vis-a-vis -vis the Aussie dollar, um, it has rebounded somewhat in recent months, but if that continues, you're going to get a foreign currency gain uh, through that exposure as well. So again, if you like the UK market, there's an easy way of getting access uh, through F100. A couple, the last two there are some more. Uh, I'll just mention robotics first because, again, this is a, 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 an ETF that invests in the top robotics companies around the world. 
Uh, it just so happens that many of those are in Asia and, 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 and for example, in Japan, something like 40% of an index. So although it is a great long-term thematic, it has been caught up a little bit uh, with the trade wars and with the, uh, the pullback in Asian equity markets uh, over the past year. So but again, that one should be primed to rebound along with this Asian equity markets if, uh, if markets can sort of get past the trade wars. And by that token, also the Asia Fund as well, so ASIA, which is effectively a global, uh, uh, sorry, an Asian technology style fund. So the top technology companies uh, in non-Japan Asia, typically many of those are found in China. Again, has been beaten up a little bit because of the trade wars, um, but a bit like India, the longer term story uh, for Asian technology and robotics is still very strong, but um, it's, it, it's had, had a, uh, like a short run cyclical pullback um, at the moment. So something to watch out for in 2020. That's pretty much it. I uh, hope there was something in there for, for you. Uh, just obviously some investment risks to consider. Um, all, all our, all, I'll let you go through that in, in detail. Obviously, this has been general investment advice. I should point out it's not um, uh, not personal advice. I'm not aware of your own personal financial situation. Uh, and certainly, if you want personal advice, seek out a very good financial planner. There are many available around the country. Um, and also, all of our funds do have a product disclosure statements attached to them, which you can find uh, on our website. Um, so ha thank you very much for your time and happy to take questions. Thank you, yes. Uh, Dave, there's a few questions coming through and uh, we've got some time to take some. So um, there was, sorry, um, where does population growth fit into all of this? Um, we import, it will take uh, 200,000 plus a year into Australia. So how, how does population growth fit into what you've been talking about? Yes, uh, look, uh, interesting question because yes, populate, we have the highest rate of uh, population growth in the OECD in the, in the developed world and the highest rate of immigration. So we certainly, uh, we, we like to protect our borders and all that sort of stuff, but we certainly don't mind uh, letting a lot of uh, people come and, um, you know, um, take up residence in Australia. So it has, like in a direct sense, it contributes to economic growth, obviously, when you've got more people in the country, um, GDP, so it's been boosting our GDP in that sense. I mean, as, a, as the government like to say, we're one of the fastest growing countries still, nonetheless, in the OEC. Well, we have been up until recently, at least, uh, and, and a good chunk of that has been due to immigration. Uh, finally, one of the other challenges, though, of that is that uh, employment growth has been pretty good up until late, and what is outright employment growth. And one of the reasons for that, again, is because uh, population growth has been strong. Um, but, but as a result, um, because of strong population, labour force growth has been pretty strong. And so uh, even though employment growth has been okay, we've had the unemployment rate drifting higher over the last six months. So it does mean that we need to grow pretty strong uh, at, a, at a pretty strong pace to stop the unemployment rate rising. Mm -hmm. uh, and a comment or a question, uh, I believe F100, uh, which is our FTSE 100 ETF, uh, has a lot of European and US companies and is more an indicator of European global performance than the UK. Would that be right? That is a, a very astute observation, I, I, I would point out. In fact, it is true that, again, although it's, uh, when you talk about the FTSE 100, everyone does associate it with the UK because it's basically companies to be in that index, you need to be listed on the London Stock Exchange. So that's hence the, the UK link. But many of the companies in the FTSE are basically brand name. Uh, you know, we're talking about HSBC Holdings, Royal Dutch Shell, um, Galaxo, Diego, British American Tobacco, Unilever, Rio Tinto. Many big global, uh, uh, typically a lot of consumer staple companies. Uh, and something like 70% of the earnings of those companies come from outside of the UK. Um, so that's why when the pound has been weakening because of the Brexit concerns, it's actually been helping support their, 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 their earnings in, pound, in, US, in pound terms. And so it's actually helped support the FTSE index. But so very astute observation, um, uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, so what sectors, bring it back to the Australian economy here, what sectors uh, in Australia stand to benefit further from a lowering of the cash rate? 
So I think you did, um, you did sort of mention it. But yes. Yeah. Look, I, I, I haven't got the chart, but next time I will show it because uh, if you actually look at the sectors, what the market, just, just what I'll tell you what I think will happen or what should happen and what's been happening, but if you actually go through the sectors that have been, been doing well in Australia, it's actually been the technology sector. I mean, we're hearing a lot about the wank, the, what are they, wax stocks? So the wax stocks. Mm -hmm. Now, that's something like 2% of our market. Um, the, by market capitalisation, but they certainly get something like 80% of the headlines at the moment because they all seem to be doing pretty well, at least in terms of share price performance. They're all incredibly richly valued, um, so I'm always I'm a bit dubious of our tech sector. I don't want to sort of be anti-innovation in Australia, but they're all incredibly richly valued. And I always say, if you want tech exposure, um, you can't go past something like the Nasdaq uh, ETF that we have because then you're talking about real tech. You're talking about Google, Amazon, Facebook. Uh, companies with real earnings, uh, valuations certainly not as inflated as the tech companies uh, here in Australia. But that, that's been one that's been doing well. Consumer discretionary stocks and in, industrial stocks have been doing well as well. So you know, funnily enough, in this slowdown, it's been the cyclical areas of our market that have been going up in recent months. And again, I guess it's optimism that the RBA rate cuts and the tax cuts from the government will do something to support spending. But again, so far at least we haven't seen evidence of that. But the markets are sort of getting up, getting up in anticipation of that. Another area that's been doing well is healthcare. You know, our, our big leading global healthcare companies. Um, so again, that's a good one in the sense that it's defensive, but it's been doing well. But what has also been doing uh, relatively, been doing okay, uh, has been the more. I mean, the problem with our defensive value, a defensive yield part of our market, a big chunk of that is typically financials, and by that I mean banks. But banks, as we all know, for, very, for the regulatory reasons and whatnot, have been, uh, have been beaten up over the past year. Um, so they haven't really been standout performers. So typically high yield type exposures with heavy exposure to banks, at least in terms of relative performance of the market, haven't been doing uh, that well because of that. Uh, but, but the other areas like infrastructure, utilities, um, uh, listed property, certainly listed property outside of the retail sector um, have been doing okay. And again, this is one area, again, like here at BetaShares, we have 50 odd funds and many of which are passive, some of which are active. And we like to say we're agnostic on the passive versus active. And in some areas, active makes sense. And in fact, uh, at the moment, the, you know, the, the yield plays in Australia, given the challenges of the banking sector, given some of the structural challenges uh, with the re uh, retail property, it's actually a, a case to be made for passive investment in this area, such as through the RINC ETF, R-I-N-C, because um, you know, they're able to basically sort out who they think uh, are, are going to hold up and have a reliable yield and they're not what's called dividend traps. So, so in our market, there is a risk of chasing yield and, and actually getting caught up with uh, companies that won't be able to sustain that yield. So active management uh, can play a role, I think, given the challenges in our market. So RINC is one, R-I-N-C, and also E-I-N-C, Inc., which is another actively managed uh, high-income um, uh, ETF that, that we have as well. So again, we're active, we're passive versus active agnostic, and given the challenges of our market in seeking out yield, active, um, you know, arguably can make some sense at the moment. Uh, and just uh, specifically, uh, does QLPY, when you do talk about quality and, and return on income, um, earnings, sorry, um, does it take into account any ESG factors? Look, not per se. Um, not per se. The, the screens are more based around profitability and sustainability of profitability. Um, but by its nature, it, it ends up having a, a, a bit of a technology skew uh, and, a, and a skew toward companies that tend to do well uh, on, on ESG grounds, environmental grounds, uh, in any case. So many of the technology sector uh, type areas. Um, so, but having said, if, if, if ESG is, a, is, is, a, is an issue, if you are seeking a, a global ethical uh, type fund, and, one, and again, one that happens to have done quite well also is, is our global, um, uh, global ethical uh, ETF um, uh, sustainability leader sustainability yes E T H I E T H I is the code uh, and again that is a it's a global fund that has a, a broad set of rules 
to um, to strip out companies involved in you know controversial activities like armaments and and you know the cigarettes and gambling and whatnot. But it also has a green uh, overview as well. Companies to be included in the index need to be pretty have a a, a lower than average carbon footprint uh, within their industry. So they need to be making efforts to um, not be too carbon intensive. Thank you. Um, and we have just run over time, so I do apologise for that. There were so many questions. Um, we might uh, wrap them up um, in, a, in a blog uh, for some um, content later on our website. <coughs> but if, um, if you do have any other comments, um, please feel free to send them through. We do thank you for your time today. And just as I mentioned at the start of the session, a recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be sent to everyone who registered today. So please look out for that um, in, in your inbox later this afternoon. Um, and thank you very much for joining us at our Q3 um, economic update. And we look forward to seeing you again next month um, for our next, next webinar and also uh, towards the end of the year um, to, to, to sort of round off that economic commentary. So thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Thank See you, you next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye.